So James 1, beginning in verse 12 through to 18. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast, uh, steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> It is the temptation of all of us to speak first and think later and to use our tongue in ways that, um, that are not honoring to God. And though this section isn't actually about the tongue, uh, the very idea of perhaps raising the question that God is tempting me in and of itself is a misuse of the tongue. But this is said in the context, as we saw last week, of learning to live with the trials that God has for us. Learning to live with the trials that God takes us through. And therefore, it's important this morning that as we come back to James, to recognize that even last week, right through this week, and right up to now this morning, God is working in your life. And God is working in your life in such a way that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. This is God's ultimate goal. Uh, for his and his desire for your life that you are beautiful in his eyes but you are not yet complete and in many ways this is kind of reflective of the original creation God created in six days but the creation and the rested on the seventh so that you got a seven day week but God created in six days but it was not um, it was not complete it, it wasn't as if there wasn't more to happen and the very command to go forth and multiply was the idea that you take what God has made and then you, there's more to come. There's much more to come. Well, God has made you alive in Christ Jesus, but now there is more as you live out your life in this world towards uh, glory, where you are to become complete, you're to become perfect, you're, be, you're to become the person who is lacking in nothing. And so the temptation is, as we saw last week, to somehow avoid the trial. We cannot educate our way out of the trial. We cannot buy our way out of the trial. We cannot remove ourselves from the trial by removing ourselves to a different place, a time or location, because God will just have a whole new set of trials there waiting for us. So there is nowhere we can go where we can escape God. Not that we would want to, but in the temptation of the trial, we may think we can actually get away from the trial, but all that we do is create an extended trial or run into another trial um, because God will use all these things to bring us to him. The most important thing here is to recognize that the trial is a good gift. This isn't seen necessarily in the moment, but every trial is a good thing and every perfect gift comes from God. And so what James does here is he is about to move your attention from the trial that is the circumstance that you are in to the testing and the temptation that occurs within the actual trials. So from verse 12, that we would understand that trials produce perseverance, but funnily, in those areas, temptation springs forth. So the trial produces perseverance in you, and perseverance under trial makes you complete, lacking in nothing. But temptation, temptation springs up in the very area where you are trying to persevere the most in your faith. 
And so the one thing that temptation goes after is to stop you from persevering. It's to stop you from walking. It's just to make you give up. And so we may think, well, I may be tempted with this, that, or the other. The ultimate aim of, of temptation is to stop you in your tracks, to stop you from continuing to walk with God faithfully in a practical Christian way. And so before we kind of go any further with that thought, we need to notice the pattern that James has emerged, or rather that has emerged in James's writing. Notice this. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, he explains that we will go through trials of various kinds, and we are to consider these joy. We may begin to doubt, verse 6, but we are to ask God for wisdom. We may think that other people have it easier because they are rich, verse 10. And then, because of all of this, we may be tempted to say that actually God is tempting me. Why? Because the temptation appears at the same time the trial does, or at least very near to the same time. The temptation appears in the same area that the trial is presenting itself. And so doubt has, in many ways, the same functions as temptation. Look at it. Verse 6, doubt, a man who doubts, is driven and tossed. In other words, he is not led by himself. He is led by his doubting that's making him a man who is driven and tossed. But deception, being deceived, being tempted into deception, verses 14 and 16, also means that we have been lured and enticed away. Okay, we have been lured and enticed away by ourselves again. So both doubt and temptation and sin are the driving forces here. Doubt causes a man to be double-minded, uh, driven and tossed, and lin, uh, sorry, sin causes a man to be lured and enticed away into temptation, away from perseverance. So the man, in both cases, whether he is doubting or being tempted, the, the same thing is happening to him. He becomes unstable, unable to walk before God. And so doubt has the same function as deception does in temptation. Temptation in sin causes a man to lose control, a woman, a child, to lose control over the direction they are walking in, just in the same way doubt does. Well, God, in back in verse 5, gives wisdom to those who ask, because, verse 17, wisdom is a good gift. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And therefore, we're to understand, this is the clear understanding, we're to understand the difference between what God gives and what we give ourselves. God gives trials. God gives various trials. God gives wisdom, which is good. And we give ourselves doubt and temptation. Because doubt comes from us, it doesn't come from God. Temptation comes from us, it doesn't come from God. The trials do, but the temptation doesn't. And so what James is trying to get you to understand is that there are things that come from God which are good, and there are things that come from you which are not good. The things that come from you will make you unstable in all your ways, and those things which come from God are able to plant your feet firmly on the road that God wants you to walk. This is the basic distinction that James is giving to us. Because every good gift from God, every gift from God is good and perfect. And so wisdom is good. Steadfastness is good. Perseverance is good. Faith is good. Doubt, not good. Temptation, not good. But where do those things come from if they don't come from God? Well, it comes from you. Double-mindedness, half-heartedness. Uh, sin that causes us to be lured and enticed away. And so you may be able to make a distinction this morning between practical Christian living and sort of sitting down and doing a Bible study, but I don't want you to think there's a separation there. So there's a distinction between studying God's Word and living a practical Christian life, but there isn't a separation. In other words, the person who knows less is going to walk less wisely, is going to more likely fall into doubt and temptation. So there is a distinction can be made between studying hard and practically living faithfully before God, but not a separation. So distinction does not lead to separation. 
And you've got to understand that because some of you may be tempted to believe, well, the, as long as I pray, as long as I, as long as I trust God, I'm just going to keep walking. No, God wants you to understand. He wants you to study. He wants you to read his word so that you become a person who knows because by knowing, you protect yourself. You will know what temptation is likely to do. And so this morning, the lessons are worthy of study, but the lessons are very practical in their application. So we're told to consider a trial as joy. Why? Because of the effect that it will have over time. We're told to understand what doubt does because it is destructive to our walk with God. We're told to ask for wisdom because if we don't, we're going to find it hard to walk the way that God has caused us to walk. And then we're told here not to be deceived in any of this. So there, there really is a great deal of emphasis placed on you understanding the walk that you have to walk. So a distinction can be made, but not to the point of separation, so that we may live a very faithful, practical Christian life. You are meant to understand so that you know what steps to take as you walk with Christ. So here's the structure of 12 through to 18. In verse 12, um, we are told to persevere. We will receive the crown of life. But when we are tempted in the trial, we are not to interpret that trial as anything more than the testing of our faith. If we think that the trial was the means that God is using to tempt us, we are lying to ourselves because God tempts no one. Temptation is found in the same place as the trial, but it does not come from the same person. Okay? Temptation is found in the same place as the trial, but it does not come from the same person. The trial comes from God. The temptation comes from us. And so any person who says... God is tempting me, I can understand why they would arrive at that conclusion because it's turning up at the same time as the trial. But they are misunderstanding the location of where they both originate from. The temptation comes from us, the trial comes from God. And so there is a distinction here that can be made between the testing, the trial, and the temptation. The trial is what God sends, the trial is the circumstance what I have to live with, what I have to go through, what I have to consider. The testing is how I then handle those circumstances. Now my faith is being tested. Am I going to respond to this circumstance faithfully or unfaithfully? Am I going to believe and trust and ask God for wisdom in the trial because that would be the faithful thing to do. My faith is being tested, and what is being tested is am I full of faith? Am I a person full of faith, or am I a person who has areas of doubt? And the trial is exposing where I find it easy to be faithful and where I find it easy to be a doubter. And this is what the trial exposes. Why? Because God wants you to know what he already knows about you. God wants you to know what he already knows about you. He takes you through the things that he does so that you would see what he sees concerning you, so that you would understand where you actually are. So God uses trials to test you so that you would see what he sees. The temptation occurs any time we desire a way of escape. Temptation is promising us a way of escape from perseverance, a way to not be responsible, a way to not be faithful. Temptation is saying, look, there is an easier way. Let's do it that way. And of course, there isn't. Temptation is lying because temptation comes from sin where we are lured and enticed and eventually it leads to death. So the role of temptation is that temptation perseveres to stop you persevering. Temptation perseveres to stop you from persevering in the faith. That's the reason you are being lured and enticed by your own, because you're finding it hard, you're finding it difficult. And temptation is saying, 
there is a way of escape. You can relieve yourself from all the pressure. You can relieve yourself from all the trial, all the difficulty. Just do this, believe this, or go there. Temptation promises a way of escape, but it only leads to death. And we see that in verse 16. And so do not be deceived. Firstly, do not be deceived concerning the trial. That comes from God. Do not be uh, deceived concerning the reason for the trial. God is perfecting you. And do not be deceived concerning the temptation. That doesn't come from God. That comes from you. And don't be deceived where it will lead you to. Good things come from God and bad things come from us in the context here. Okay? Good things come from God. We, lead, we are led to the crown of life. Bad things come from us. Sin leads to death. This is the basic distinction that uh, James is making. God gives us new life. God promises the crown of life to those who love them. Temptation promises us the same thing but hiding all the dangers. And the danger is you won't get there. You will indeed die because that's where sin leads to. And so let's look at this in the context of trials, testing, and temptation. Anybody who's walked up a hill will understand that stepping forward is easier than standing still. That stepping forward is harder than standing still. And what is even easier is going downhill than uphill. So there are some things which we know instinctively and have experienced are actually easier. But you don't get to the top hill without the steps taking you there. And the steps going uphill are harder than the steps that take you downwards. Well, this is a very simple illustration to show you how experience works in the role of temptation. Okay, experience plays a part because we know what it feels like when something is easy. And uh, the form of release that we get is just so almost exhilarating that we think, well, I'll just have a few more of these. But before you realize you're further back, you're no longer moving forward, and really you're not persevering at all. You are taking a break. But it's not a helpful break because the break doesn't cause you to stand still spiritually. It actually causes you to move backwards. Think of Psalm 1, the walking, the standing, and the sitting in the wrong direction. There is a negative progression that those who walk with the wicked are then standing with the wicked and are then sitting with the wicked. There is a progression, but it's a, 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 a progression in the complete opposite way than the way you're actually to go. And so I want you to understand this morning that though the walk is hard, that God knows your limitations. And because he knows your limitations, you will never go through anything harder than what you're actually able to go through. I'll give you an example. So in Exodus 13, we read these words. Exodus 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people, listen, change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Now, here's the striking thing. God, by his wonderful power, could have led his people out of Egypt any way he chose, through the land of the Philistines, into the promised land, protecting them all the way. No problem to God whatsoever. But this is what it says, that God did not lead them the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. And what we see here is God is taking into consideration the limitations of God's people as he leads them into the promised land. God is taking into consideration the limitations of your life as he leads you to be complete, perfect, and lacking in nothing. In other words, he will not lead you in a way that is too difficult for you to go. And neither will he lead you in a way that will cause you to turn back. That's the very thing that Exodus is saying. And we think, 
God, you have brought me to a place where you are causing me to turn back. You are tempting me to turn back. No. God has already stated that he doesn't do that type of thing. God does not lead us down a track that is too difficult for us to walk. He leads us taking into consideration our limitations. Stepping forward is harder than stepping back, but God knows our limitations. Not only does God know us better than we know ourselves, he also understands that we are a people who are prone to changing our mind quite easily the moment we find something difficult. So the moment you find something difficult, and suddenly I don't want to do this anymore, right? This is hard. This is, this is difficult. <clears throat> and how many of you have actually decided to do something difficult and then said to yourself, I'm going to leave this till later in the day or I'm going to put it off for a month or whatever. And the, the reason that's happening is because you've taken on something that you think you can handle. You, you've come up face to face with your own limitations. You're finding it hard and then you don't continue. So we are prone as people in sin to change our minds the moment we find anything difficult. And so God, in a very calculating way, not in a sinful way, of course, but in a very calculating way, understands exactly how much pressure we can take every step we take as we walk with him. And so he does not lead us the way of the land of the Philistines, although that would be quicker, although that would be nearer, although that would be easier in one respect, it would be harder because those very experiences would cause you to change your mind and go back to your old way of life. And therefore, that gives us an insight to temptation, that what temptation is actually doing is causing you to default to that which you find easy. Temptation causes you to default to that which you find easy and familiar, something old, something that you've done before, something that you're comfortable with. And so temptation is not only <clears throat> encouraging you to escape the, the problems of perseverance or the difficulty of perseverance, it's telling you to escape to something that you find familiar, easy. Let's go back to Egypt. Well, Egypt was a terrible place for God's people. But why would they ever consider that better than moving forward? Well, because of the difficulty of moving forward. So God never pushes us to the limit where we would ever uh, go backwards. Temptation is what causes us to go backwards, not God. So I want you to understand the distinction there. So God knows your limitations. God uh, does not tempt you. He tests you, of course. He gives you trials, but he does not tempt you. Every good gift comes from God. Temptation comes from you. And so understand that God knows your limitations. When your faith is being tested and it feels like it's at breaking point, God knows where that breaking point is. God knows the point at which you are likely to go back to your old ways and he will not take you that far. Temptation will take you back there very quickly. So God takes us all the way, but remembering our weaknesses. Also... Think of Paul's words to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10. I'll read. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your own ability. So this is striking. But with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So... Now, God uses your temptation, but he will not let you be overcome by your own temptation. He will provide even a way of escape in the very midst of temptation. So how does this work? God gives you the trial, calls you to persevere. Temptation says there's an easier way. You don't have to persevere. There's a way of escape. And then God, in the midst of that temptation says there's a way of escape from that. Back to me. So temptation wants to take you in one direction and God is correcting us again in the middle of temptation. God will always provide a way of escape 
in the middle of your temptation that you have brought upon yourself. And the person who ignores it is the person who continues in sin. The person who recognizes that this is God calling me to turn around and yet doesn't turn around and continues is the person who has decided to walk sinfully, who is lured and has been enticed by his own lusts, by his own desires in the midst of the trial. In other words, he's lured away from persevering. He's lured away from walking with God. He desires a way of escape, but he doesn't want the way of escape that God provides. And the way of escape he chooses leads to death, but the way of escape God provides leads to life. And this is the distinction that James is making almost over and over again in multiple different ways. The person who perseveres, verse 12, receives the crown of life for those who love God. But the person who is tempted is lured and enticed. He has a life, we've looked at this before, a life under compulsion, not in control. Feels like he's in control because it's easy. But he's not in control. He's lured and enticed away into doing the very thing that God does not want him to do. So we are not put through a trial beyond what we can handle. We are not even tempted beyond our ability, as if it can overtake us. God provides a way of escape. Now, the Lord is not wanting us to turn back, but the Lord is wanting us to make us perfect wanting to make us complete and steadfast. He wants you to be a person who is lacking in nothing. And the temptation for you is, is to think, I'm quite happy to remain as I am until Christ returns. In other words, my energy levels now that I'm older have diminished, and I don't know if I've got the desire or the energy to change any further than what I have. In other words, I'm quite happy with the way that I am and I'm going to stay this way and therefore I'm not going to persevere in my faith. Well, God has a particular way of dealing with such people and that is the various trials are not something that you can choose to enter into. They're not something that you can choose to avoid. God sends them your way and I've met plenty of people after, what, 24 years in ministry where people have got to retirement and their children have left home and they've got grandchildren on the way and suddenly in the very years where they would think it would be the easiest, suddenly trouble hits the family and now their very years have become the hardest. And the temptation is again that we think if we get older and we get it all sorted out and we get all the boxes ticked, then all of a sudden we've escaped the worst of it. And God is a way of reminding us that no, it doesn't matter what age and stage you are in life, there are always trials to go through because you are not yet complete, perfect, lacking in nothing. Your maturity will bring about the crown of life. But notice what James says about sin's maturity. When sin matures and it is fully grown, it leads to death. But your maturity in Christ leads to what? The crown of life. It's the very opposite. And so either you can walk the path that God has given you, though difficult, and receive the crown of life to those who love God, or you can be enticed and driven and tossed away by your own lust and desires and doubt, looking for a way of escape from persevering in the faith, only to end up in death. If we're saying, well, I'm not, I'm not trying to escape my walk with God. I'm not trying to get away from God. I'm just finding the trial difficult. Well, God sent the trial. God is giving you the trial. It, it, God is with you in the trial. And so in many sense, if you're trying to get away from the trial, you're trying to get away from God who's leading you through this. Well, let me give you an example of how this actually works. Asaph in Psalm 73 allows us to see how a temptation occurs in the midst of a trial. 
Asaph is a man whose foot had almost slipped. He's speaking reflectively in Psalm 73. And this is what he says. He says, effectively, it is a waste of time to live for God. A waste of time to live. This is what he says. All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said thus, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed a generation of your children. All in vain. Here I am, going out to work every single day, coming home and I'm watching people that have got way more, doing way more, don't seem to have any problems in life, no pains, no sorrows, no ills, have what they want, when they want it, and here I am, waking up every morning, repenting of my sin, and it doesn't seem worth it. What a waste of time. And I see people out in the world who seem to be living exactly the way they want to, no care for anything, no love for God, and getting away with it. And now it feels to me as I look at these people that my whole Christian life is just a waste of time because there doesn't seem to be an end to my perseverance. There doesn't seem to be an end to my faithfulness. There just doesn't seem to be an end to me living faithfully for God. It's just the same thing day in, day out, and no change, nothing different. That's what Asaph feels like. And when you ask the question, well, how on earth did you get there as a person of God? And he says that instead of looking at God, I began to look at my neighbor. And I saw their fancy cars, and I saw their full bellies, and I saw what they ate for tea, and I saw what cars they were driving, and I saw what jobs that they had. And suddenly I began to look at them so much that I realized, or rather, I forgot what I had in God. And then he says, the, the, the only time he was brought to his senses is when he came back into the worship of God, into the sanctuary, and saw what a brutish, ignorant person he was being. And we looked at this in Sunday school, that the moment you are consumed by desires that you don't have, you become deaf, dumb, and blind to the things of God. You become spiritually desensitized, dull to the things of God. And so the reason why he was tempted away is because his eyes were no longer on what God was doing in his life, holding him by his right hand, leading him all the way. Instead, he was looking at what other people had and he didn't have, and then began to consider that his perseverance was all in vain, that his living the godly life was all in vain. And so I want to assure you this morning that you are not free from that kind of thing happening to you. You take your eyes off of God. You take your eyes off of what God is doing in your life, and you will be just like every other godless person in this world. It's a definite. You cannot avoid it. Because <clears throat> we become like, as I said this morning, what we make, what we set our eyes on, the goals that we set. And so Asaph's life is no longer shaped by faithfulness to God because he's looking at unfaithful people and now his life is shaped by them. That's how it works. And so we must consider that what God is doing ultimately, leading to the crown of life, is the understanding we need to appreciate that when we repent of our sins and when we follow Christ and we read our Bibles and we pray and we lay forth our tithes and offerings and we do all of these things, that none of it is in vain because all of it is being used by God to shape us into the person that we ought to be. And so he doesn't say anything because if he did, it would be to betray a whole generation of people who would say otherwise. He is a man, as James would say, has been lured and enticed, driven and tossed by his own doubts and his own sin. He is not making wise decisions, but foolish ones as he is following the desires of his sinful heart. And now the trouble with this, and this is where we come to an end, is to recognize that those things are real. And it becomes very hard for many Christians to distinguish the difference 
between that which is real and that which is right. Walking down a hill is easier than going uphill. That's real. But if God is at the top, it's not right. So though the experience is real, the reality is it's not right. And this is what James wants us to understand, that driven and tossed, lured and enticed is real. It feels. It actually makes experiential difference to our life all the time. But it's not right. But it feels right. Of course it feels right, because it's a feeling. It's there. And so remember this. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Temptation promises a way of escape that leads only to death. And God promises a way forward that will not lead you backwards, that leads to the crown of life. None of you should ever believe that you are being tempted by God but you are tempted by yourself in the trial that God has given you. And God is the father of lights, which is another way of saying in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. It's just another way of saying that God does not alter. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God knows your limitations. God knows your weaknesses. But God also knows, and this is what he wants you to know, that good things come from him in the context of wisdom and faith and perseverance. And the things that lead you away come from you. The doubt comes from you. The temptation comes from you. It does not come from God. And so let me finish with this. Giving up is always easier than continuing. Giving up is always easier than continuing. Temptation <clears throat> is like the get-rich-quick scheme that never works. Promises you riches and delivers absolutely nothing. Instead, if anything, it robs you of what you have right now. The one thing that temptation is seeking to do above all else is to stop you persevering in your faith. And so sin perseveres to stop you persevering in your faith. And temptation offers you an easy way out. But that way out leads to death. But the way of perseverance leads to life, the crown of life for those who love God. And so what James shows us here is that though the life God has called us to live involves trials and difficulties, it is a life that you can live. It is not impossible. It is a life that you can live in the power of God and the spirit of God <clears throat> in light of the word of God. Amen. Let me pray for us. Gracious God and Father, we ask of you this morning that you forever remind us that, <clears throat> that we would understand that you are mindful of our weaknesses, that you are mindful of our limitations and that there is nothing that we will face tomorrow that you have not already measured out to the correct measure to make us the person you want us to be so father god may we be mindful of who you are and never forget this as we consider the life that you have given us to live in jesus name amen